It's been three months since Operation Al-Aqsa flood and the commencement of Israel's brutal bombing of Gaza. What is the situation of the people of Gaza and the whole of Palestine? Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has won a fourth term, fourth consecutive term after a controversial election. What lies ahead for the country? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Over 23,000 dead, the decimation of an entire territory and a massive humanitarian crisis. None of this has stopped Israel from continuing its brutal genocidal offensive on the people of Gaza, which has now entered its fourth month. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on the tour of the region to try and prevent, or it seems to try and prevent a regional war. But this has also not stopped Israel from attacking Lebanon in various instances, the most recent instance being the assassination of a senior Hezbollah leader. What is the situation in Gaza? What are the risks of escalation of this offensive into a regional conflict? We go to Abdul for all these details. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. It's been three months since Operation Alexa flood and the commencement of the brutal Israeli offensive on the people of Gaza. We've been talking about it very regularly on this show, of course. And this has not only been restricted to the people of Gaza, it's also an offensive that has escalated uh, into Lebanon. There's been impact on Syria. There's been impact on Ira uh, Iraq, for that matter. But some of the latest developments include the assassination of, the, uh, of a Hezbollah commander. So could you maybe first uh, talk a bit about what has happened there and what are the kind of responses? Well, uh, at the time when Anthony Blinken is on his fourth trip to the region, uh, basically in order to kind of constrain the conflict from not becoming a regional uh, war, uh, at that very moment, Israel chose to basically attack southern Lebanon and at it, at, as it has been doing for the last three months and basically killed one of the top uh, Kama, Hezbollah commanders. The, the name of the commander is still not out in media uh, for some reasons, but uh, it basically uh, means a kind of provocation which uh, Hezbollah uh, uh, chief has been talking about in his speeches uh, last week in particular, uh, when he said that uh, any attempt by Israel to co continue to attack uh, southern Lebanon would lead to uh, retaliation and that may uh, be a full-fledged war. Though yet no uh, formal announcement has been made, of course, there will be Hezbollah retaliation for sure. Because uh, 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 as we remember last week, when uh, one of the Hamas commanders was killed, uh, assassinated in Beirut by Israelis, Hezbollah did uh, retaliate and attack uh, military bases in northern uh, Israel. So similar things uh, is expected. Uh, we, of course, we do not know yet whether it will lead to any much serious attacks on the uh, uh, Israeli installations in the northern uh, Israel in particular. But yeah, there will be retaliation. And that basically also means that Israel is not very worried about uh, dragging Hezbollah into the war. Uh, uh, this was, in fact, one of the initial, in, during the initial days of the war in Gaza, there were speculation that Israel wants a war with Hezbollah as well. So what happened on uh, Monday, it seems that this is a, a step towards that. In this context, now to go to the larger picture, we have, uh, you know, we've been talking about the death toll, the horrific death toll, of course, every day hundreds being killed, the impact on uh, the impact on children, especially so many thousands of children, and also the fact that this is not uh, the con as the South Africa's petition in the International Court of Justice shows. This is not only, you know, just the toll of war itself or just the result of bombing, but it seems like a larger campaign to sort of target the Palestinian people as a whole in all kinds of ways. But I want to sort of come to the point of uh, what you talked about earlier, that this is, and this is happening when Antony Blinken is making his fourth visit. There have been all kinds of statements from the United States. So how do you sort of see over these months the international uh, response? You know, what are the kind of trends when it comes to these kind of responses? Well, uh, if you see uh, the responses uh, coming from the international community, have by and large remained the same since the beginning of the war. There has been a division. Uh, one set of countries, uh, mostly the US and its NATO allies, 
from Europe have basically taken a stand, which basically sympathizes with so-called Israel right to defend itself and so on and so forth, and basically gives a green light to whatever Israel is doing in in uh, not only in Gaza, but also in West Bank. Uh, both of these territories have been constantly attacked by Israelis. Of course, Gaza, the extent of Gaza bombing and assault has been a huge in comparison to what is happening in West Bank. But nonetheless, the point is, Israel has been attacking Palestinians all across the Palestine occupied territories. And the West, the US, and its European allies, uh, UK, France, even Germany, have completely supported all those attacks. And even in the Security Council, they have kind of um, blocked whenever there was an attempt to demand accountability, to kind of establish a ceasefire, to save as many Palestinians' lives as possible. On all those oca occasions, US in particular, but it, also its European allies basically used their veto power to block all those resolutions. And they reduced uh, the issue of Palestine to only humanitarian aid and nothing beyond that. They, that's what their attempt. And whenever there was a, a, an attempt to, to basically by, made by countries like, say, Russia, China, and other, uh, uh, most of the other third world countries to basically demand for ceasefire and demand for accountability uh, and demand for the larger attempts to establish peace in the region while uh, addressing the long uh, uh, a very uh, important question of two-state solution. All of these basically were, again, reduced. There was an attempt to reduce it to Hamas versus Israel. And that's what the West has been trying to do. Even uh, when uh, Blinken is visiting the region, he is talking about two-state solution, as has been the U.S. position for a very long time. But he's not talking about ceasefire. And he's not talking about uh, kind of uh, even thus, uh, as you rightly pointed out, South Africa's petition in the uh, international uh, uh, court basically is basically has been ridiculed by the us that whatever, whatever israel is doing has nothing no, there is no evidence of genocide there is no evidence of war crime and so on and so forth so that is one position of course uh, if you see uh, just to kind of sum it up one can see that there uh, there has been a greater uh, you can say attempts in the last few weeks at least by the western allies uh, us western allies to portray that they are also concerned about humanitarian situation in gaza and therefore they have started talking about more about humanitarian aid and also about quote unquote saving a civilian life while israel has the right continues to have the right to attack uh, uh, gaza so they are trying to create a balance between the uh, the dis uh, the popular uh, you can say uh, anger which has emerged following the uh, killing of thousands of Palestinians. More than 23,000 23, Palestinians have been killed, and more than 75% 70 of them are children, women, and other non-combatants, uh, e people from non-combatant age. So uh, there has been an attempt to kind of balance the discourse, but it seems that, that their, attempt, uh, their, their attempts to kind of balance the hum uh, discourse by bringing in humanitarian um, issues while completely ignoring the political and the larger uh, issues uh, is not working. And more and more people are agitated uh, on the streets across the globe. And also the reason, the countries in the reason, and particularly the militias, what we call the excess of resistance, are not buying it. And they continue to basically stand with the Palestinian people in solidarity of Palestine. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then finally, just to sort of also take a look at the humanitarian situation, what could you give us an overview of what's happening? Well, uh, the, the humanitarian situation is, uh, uh, as we have already talked about it, is in a very bad state, in uh, particularly in Gaza, where more than 80% population is displaced, displaced, and even in the shelters where they are forced to live, are not they are not safe because those shelters have also been attacked. Then there are attacks of repeated attacks, in fact, um, uh, on hospitals. One hospital uh, which was attacked in the initial days of the Israeli land uh, uh, incursion is basically uh, has been re-attacked again in the recent days. And uh, according to the reports, around 600 health workers and patients which were there in, uh, uh, in, in uh, northern Gaza hospital, are comp uh, their whereabouts are not known whether they have been taken by the israeli forces whether they have been killed whether they are 
what happened to them is it not clear for last 24 hours there are reports which says that there is no clarity about the situation on on the other front uh, there is a uh, allegation made by the different kinds of international organizations including the unroa which basically says that israel is using a starvation as a weapon against the palestinians so around 40 to 50% of palestinian population in gaza is basically deprived of basic uh, uh, food and uh, uh, other nutrition uh, uh, elements which basically leads to uh, uh, greater uh, starvation and hunger in the region and that is also the situation apart from the f that the 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 un resolution which talked about increasing the humanitarian aid uh, which was the last thing which was achieved in the united nations security council is also not working in fact uh, the humanitarian aid the flow of humanitarian aid has not increased in any substantial manner since the united nations security council adopted that resolution it means most of the palestinians in gaza are uh, in a very uh, bad state and uh, both uh, health wise and uh, 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 and of course the physical security wise thank you so much but do stay back we'll come back to you for our next story Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has won a fourth consecutive term in power after elections which were boycotted by the main opposition party, the BNP. Now, the elections were controversial coming after massive protests, which Sheikh Hasina and those following her said were a result of actions by right-wing elements. In fact, many of the opposition do comprise extremist right-wing forces, including the Jamaat-e-Islami. Now, Sheikh Hasina in power, would, what does this mean for the country? What does it mean for its relations with its neighbours and global powers? What are the challenges facing this new government? We go back to Abdul to understand all of this. Welcome back, Abdul. So, as anticipated, Sheikh Hasina returning uh, for a fourth term in power, I believe. Very controversial election given the circumstances. Could you maybe take us through what really was at stake? What were the, you know, who were the players and what were the kind of uh, controversies that were involved? Well, uh, the main controversy was, uh, of course, the, ma uh, the main opposition party, the uh, Bangladesh Nationalist Party, BNP, which basically refused to participate in the election. Uh, of course, uh, alleging that Sheikh Hasina, basically it was demanding that Sheikh Hasina should resign before the election and hand over the authority to a neutral, quote-unquote, neutral agency so that the elections are conducted in a free and fair manner. That was their claim. Of course, uh, Sheikh Hasina government did not agree with it and that led to them boycotting the election. And that has basically impacted the overall uh, uh, voter turnout. Only about 42 percent, 41.8 percent uh, voter electorates came to vote. And out of that, of course, uh, Sheikh Hasina's party uh, got around 220 seats out of 300. And the opposition is completely decimated. Uh, only 11 uh, seats have been won by the Jatiya party, which is the main uh, principal opposition now in the new parliament. Uh, rest of the seats have been won by the independents uh, um, and other smaller parties, uh, which basically means that Bangladesh, again, will be without any effective opposition. Last time also, uh, out of 300, 320, 288 seats were won by, around 280 seats were won by uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina's uh, Awami League, and this continued to uh, continue to be the case. Um, yeah, apart from that, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Awami League has basically accused uh, had accused before the elections that the BNP's claims about neutrality or fairness of the election has nothing to do about the their concerns of democracy, but about their attempts to create a much more uh, uh, situ uh, a situation where they could rule by fear because uh, there were uh, attempts to initiate violence during the process of the elections. Around 14 people uh, were killed uh, during the entire campaign period and there were also uh, uh, reports of arson and uh, attempted violence in different parts of the country. So this is uh, this was uh, in the uh, this was the context in which, uh, at least the immediate context in which the elections were held in Bangladesh. But uh, elect, uh, surprisingly, this time's election has been much more peaceful than the last time uh, election. And uh, uh, yeah, th that is the overall uh, situation. Uh, results which were announced uh, earlier on Monday. Right, Abdul, <clears throat> complicated situation in Bangladesh because on the one hand, the Sheikh Hasina government accused of 
you know, suppressing protests of a streak of authoritarianism, lots of allegations of corruption as well. Well, on the other hand, the main opposition party, the BNP, and uh, its allies in the Jamaat Islami, uh, clearly having a very strong <coughs> right wing extremist streak, which is something you know, sections of the left, section, progressive sections have also been fighting against. But <coughs> what do you sort of see as the challenges for this government in the coming term? Well, the, the most important challenge, of course, is the economy. Uh, Sheikh Hasina uh, and Awami League has been uh, basically credited uh, 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 of, of for bringing uh, Bangladesh out of uh, its uh, massive economic bad backwardness and poverty uh, since 2009. Apparently, it has been a government which basically brought more than 6% annual growth since 2009. And that has also reflected in the overall uh, improvement of the living conditions all across Bangladesh. Of course, it is not at the par uh, as it was expected, but it has been much better uh, in condition than what it was before. But in the last few years, particularly since 2019, uh, first due to the COVID outbreak, because Bangladesh is primarily export uh, dependent economy, and also because of the uh, the war uh, in, uh, in in basically in Europe between Russia and Ukraine, which has basically led to uh, it also is dependent on the import of uh, particularly energy resources. This basically has created a mismatch in the uh, Bangladesh economy. Inflation has risen. The living standards for the particularly the working class because the exports got stagnated. And because of that, the working class, which is hugely dependent on the export of garment uh, products, um, is basically are suffering. Up. So that needs to be addressed. And that would be the primary concern. Apart from that, the, the as you rightly pointed out, BNP and Jamaat Islami and other groups have been basically accused of bringing uh, uh, radical uh, religious elements, the right-wing elements into the Bangladesh society. That uh, is, of course, given the fact that it is a society which is basic, which has a substantial number of uh, minorities, which has a substantial number of uh, other uh, groups which do not uh, uh, follow the kind of dictates the religious right wing he has been uh, raising in Bangladesh, the controlling such elements and kind of introducing a much fairer, much uh, uh, open society in Bangladesh is also one of the major concerns, and that basically is reflected in the uh, in the repeated vote to Amavi League, which is considered to be much more open, much more secular. Uh, in your orientation than uh, Khalida Jia's or Bangladesh uh, Nationalist Party, which basically has been accused of aligning with the, the right wing, uh, extreme right wing uh, groups. That is the second thing, of course. Our, the third major uh, uh, issue in Bangladesh is basically the, the workers' right, along with uh, the situation of migrants, primarily uh, the Rohingya refugees uh, in Bangladesh. So how uh, the government will tackle that uh, those issues is to be seen and that is the major these are the major challenges in front of Sikh Hasina government apart from that of course the relations with India is also on the agenda always have always been on the agenda despite the fact that there has been improvement claims of improvement of relationship there are always issues which basically because uh, India uh, ruled by a right-wing government also has also accused repeatedly that Bangladesh has been a source of illegal immigration, quote-unquote illegal immigration to the country. And that led, leads to uh, uh, problems between both the countries from time to time. So these are uh, the major issues which Sheikh Hasina government will have to face in its in her fourth term, consecutive term. Of course, this is her fifth term altogether, but this is the fourth consecutive term for her. Thank you so much for that analysis. That's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow with a fresh episode. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button.